there's there seem to be like the, a subgenre for Jeff dinosaurs. Uh, stop motion dinosaurs. Yeah, stop motion dinosaurs. Was this one like this one wasn't full moon? No, no, it was going to be. It was going to be released by Empire, Charles Band's okay. production company, but then they went bankrupt. So, oh, old mate Harry Brimage, welcome to Reanimates. Ah, oh, thanks, old mate Lisa Dip. Uh, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be on the show. Yeah, we go way back, back to the old country. Harry Brimage. Yes. What movie are we doing today? Uh, we're doing The Phantom Empire. Hell yeah, we are. Which is, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a hard one to remember. I kept just referring to it in my head as that film uh, <laughs> because it has nothing to do with the title. No, it doesn't. It's really strange that it's, it's a 1988 film. It is not the 1935 Gene Autry movie, but it is kind of a little... I guess, homage to that kind of era of sci-fi movies, I suppose, in that way that B-movies sometimes are. Yeah. I saw this, yeah, the 1935, it was a sci-fi Western serial. I guess this is a, it's kind of a, it's got a bit of a Wild West vibe to it in the (laughs) sense that it's extremely fucking loose and just... (laughs) Uh, does whatever the fuck it wants. Well, at least one of the characters in the 1988 version wears a cowboy hat throughout the whole film. So there you go. Yeah, yeah. If that isn't an homage, I don't know what is. It was directed by one of the masters of B-movies, Fred Olin Ray, extremely prolific guy. Uh, I think he's directed 160 or 161 films. Yeah, he's, I think it is, uh, he's the same age as Jeffrey Combs. I think he's 65 or 66 or something. The other Roger Corman, basically. I've watched this film three times now because uh, my power went out and it was the only piece of media that was on my phone (laughs) Uh, because we didn't get, we didn't have a phone signal either. So I couldn't use the internet. That's so, so funny. It's like being trapped on a desert island and the only thing you have as entertainment is Phantom Empire 1988. Hey, there's worse things you could be watching because, spoiler alert, I actually really like this movie <laughs> and not in like an ironic way. Like I think it's super fun and it knows exactly what it's doing. It it, it has no pretensions about being this grand sci-fi epic adventure. Like it knows it's a B movie and it's having a lot of fun with it and all the cast are having fun and that's what's important to me. I think it took me a couple of viewings <laughs> to get to where you're at. I don't think I got it the first time I watched it. And then no, it was the second same. and third ones, I was like, oh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it. I'm, I'm down now. Uh, there's a lot of good character stuff. And that's, that's what you want out of a Jeffrey Combs movie. Like, I think his strongest films are the ones with, like, really big personalities uh yeah yeah the actors get to have fun and that's that's the best that's what you want to say yeah yeah especially in b movies obviously like that's that's supposed to be their entire point and this one it's funny it doesn't really have a main character like you can't really say this is the protagonist the protagonist there's definitely people that we are introduced to first but then everyone kind of gets equal screen time after that because they're all together for the rest of the film so Fred Olin Ray also directed uh, two other films with Jeffrey Combs, uh, 1987's Cyclone and 2010's American Bandits, Frank and Jesse James. So there's some more little links there. Uh, this was also written okay. by Olin Ray and T.L. Lang- Langford, which, again, unless you like B-movies, you have no reason to know those names. <laughs> um, there's a little quote from Fred Olin Ray about this movie. He actually put a lot of his own money into the movie, uh, almost entirely, I think. Uh, and he said this in an interview. Like almost entirely all of his money or almost entirely the film is budgeted on his money? The latter. Okay. Yeah. So he said this in an interview. I was so tired of dealing with companies where you can't get any freedom. Every decision has to be okayed by committee and most times you didn't get what you wanted. So I decided to risk my own money on the Phantom Empire to have my own way. Right now, in fact, American Independent is doing so well that I don't have to work for anyone else for the rest of the year. I've never made a lot of money off my films, and I think it's about time I do so. 
I'm going to continue making bigger budgeted pictures for companies while on the side, produce other content that I can control. So it, it's clear that this was like the start of a bit of a different track for him. Like it's obviously like a point where he had a lot more creative control. Yeah, he obviously had a huge passion for it if he was putting his own money into it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, it's it's funny to think of this as a passion project, but it's also like it, it couldn't have been any other thing. This this is not yeah. There's no committee approval to to anything that happens in this. Like, <laughs> so this was also filmed in uh, six or seven days as well. <laughs> which, wow. Uh, uh, no, well, actually, no, not wow. Because uh, <laughs> they they reuse a lot of the same like locations. You get to know the the three locations that they filmed this on, and yeah, uh, there's not a lot of scenery changes. <laughs> No, there's also, most of the film is a lot of just walking around. And so because it's filmed in a real sort of cave system out in California, uh, you can't really tell when the scenery changes anyway. (laughs) One of the things I was obviously really glad about when I wanted to get you on the podcast, Harry, is that not only obviously do I know that you're really into B-movies, but you're also a fellow Jeffrey Combs fan, which is very nice <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i uh i didn't i've not gone quite as far as um uh as you have and, and dedicated myself to watching every single <laughs> jeffrey combs thing ever who has who would uh, do this <laughs> i mean i'll probably i'll get there eventually reanimator was 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 one of the first like b movies that made a real impact on me and I saw it like with a group of friends. We we played it on the projector, and you know we just went to the video store and got a bunch of stupid horror movies. And we just were riffing on it the whole time. And it was really, it was way more fun than than a lot of things I'd ever seen before. You know, I was I was still in high school, and it's so it's got a really special place uh, in my like in my heart. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah I've sort of sought out Jeffrey Combs because yeah Herbert West is just such an amazing character I've watched all the sequels I love From Beyond I love uh, The Frighteners him and The Frighteners is just amazing Uh, he's actually got uh, a little role in a game I used to play that's called The Secret World where he plays I think he's the principal of the Miskatonic University (laughs) <laughs> uh, which is appropriate and i've listened to the reanimator audiobooks uh which he narrate uh well he yeah he, he reads the books <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i've i've yeah. Li- i listened to those on a long drive once and it was wonderful so i'm i'm yeah i'm a bit of a jeffrey combs buff so <laughs> I'm not yeah I, I can't i'm certainly not close to dethroning you yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't fucking dare mate <laughs> <laughs> i would not uh <laughs> no he you, you, yeah. you're totally right there is something about there is something about him especially in those really well-known films like reanimator it, it it isn't it isn't to say that he outshines his cast because often he has really good cast members and i, I would never discount you know people like bruce abbott and barbara crampton for what they're doing in a movie but you know he's just doing something so specific and unique with the character whatever character it happens to be that you just you find yourself just wanting to watch him the whole time I think with this movie I think he actually comes up first in the credits and I wonder if that's uh, a sort of retrospective thing of him eventually sort of becoming probably the most famous person or the most well-known person later down the track after this movie yeah he's very young in this he like, is and I mean this this was after this was after reanimator but even though he's not the main character of this he gets a lot of screen time specific to him that the other characters don't so I think even though they didn't want a lead quote unquote he yeah. he he gets a lot of screen time which is fine by me yeah <laughs> well let's let, let's get into it we yeah, we open yeah. we, we open with some great text which just immediately sets you on a good vibe <laughs> for it the text is, the story you are about to see is true, capitals. Nothing has been changed. 
these are the real people who lived this great adventure. And this is exactly capitals, the way it really happened, just as they told it to me. I really mean this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fred Olin Ray's signature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course it is. That's all authentic. That It is true. Oh, it's yeah. It really did happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's basically a found footage film. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We open on POV of a monster of some sort with like kaleidoscope eyes. Got that, yeah. That compound sort of bug eye look. Doing, I like it. Yeah. I think a cheap <laughs> version of Predator. Yeah. There's a family packing up a picnic and a man, he finds their family dog eviscerated by something. And then the monster. POV shows the thing attacking a woman. We don't have to wait long, thankfully, to see the monster itself, though, because uh, we see it and then it rips the dad's heads off. The dad's head off. I actually don't know how to describe what this monster is, apart from saying, you know, it's it's a person in a bad costume. Like that's <laughs> that's all I can say. I like. I, I, I really love this opening. Uh, the the dad is ridiculous um he's like he's like i'm gonna go find our dog but he's like simon simon <laughs> where are you you little shit i'm gonna beat his hairy little butt okay and his wife's like all right well hurry up and he goes simon and then he hears his dog whine and all of a sudden like the venom his turns into concern he's like simon simon no and then <laughs> You see the monster, like, from the monster vision sneaking up on this woman who's just sitting at a picnic table. And then it reveals the monster. Uh, it's a dude in rags, and he's got, like, this gob... It's kind of like a goblin-y sort of rubber mask with, yeah, compound eyes, big buggy eyes. Mm. And uh, we'll see more of these in the movie, but they're all wearing old lady wigs. Yeah. Yeah, really, really terrible, like long white curly wigs, you know, like a yeah, yeah, like it like a like an old woman. And yeah, the no, the but... face on the masks is just kind of like generic creepy person. Like there's sort of a big mouth with sharp teeth, very hollow looking eyes. Um, it doesn't look like anything in particular that I can think of, but I will I'll I'll post some screen caps and and sound off in the sound off in the socials if you can think of anything comparable to these monsters they're not scary like that's the, the point. kind of rubber mask that you get in a show bag we cut to our two salvages they're g and g salvage which is i don't know why because none of their names they neither their first or last names start with g was it g i thought it was c and c because we've got eddie colchild played by dawn wildsmith and court eastman played by ross hagan ah maybe, so maybe i just Maybe I just read the door wrong. Uh, well, C and C would make more sense. Yeah. So Dawn Wildsmith, who plays Eddie, was actually married to Fred Olin Ray for a time. Uh, I presume during the filming of this, because I can't find any info as to when they split up. But she also okay. stopped She stopped acting around 1995 and became a surrealist artist. Huh. Hmm. So they're visited by Danae Chambers, who's plays by, played by Susie Stokey. She's wearing a fur coat. That's how you know she's a rich lady. She wants to capture the monster from the cave because the murder's been in the papers and apparently the monster was wearing this incredibly valuable necklace made of rare stones of some sort. So, oh, yeah. She, well, we didn't, we didn't say the monster, the lady whacks it with a cooler. We didn't even finish that scene. The monster rips the guy's head off. Yes, that's true. Yes, pulls. Yeah. Pulls his head off and then we're like, bam, credits. <laughs> yeah, that's the, the goriest thing that happens in the film, I think. Yeah, I, there's not a lot of gore after this, actually. No, I was um, surprised. And I think, uh, I, I think I read that that headless body prop is actually from Reanimator. Yeah, it was a good neck hole. Ah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's got a good neck hole on him. It's got a good neck hole. Uh, it's very pretty, very precise. Sexy. Want to put my uh, finger in it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so she wants court to find the necklace but she also wants court to find something called relia which is apparently a sort of a mythical lost city that's underground or in the caves uh she also has a vested interest because danae's dad was also apparently some sort of archaeologist that court knew. stokey's actually playing this really well like she's having a lot of fun everyone's having fun but she's 
having a lot of fun playing this sort of no nonsense rich lady. So she's great. I like her. Throughout the whole film, she's a lot of fun. I this scene I found it went like it, it's it's a good scene. It it sort of sets up who all the different your first three main characters are very well. Eddie is just like sort of half passed out on the couch and is laughing at everything that is happening. Yeah. Uh, well, she just and, laughs and lies there. It's really strange. Yeah, and Court's like she's just very tired from the last big job that we did we just did a really big job (laughs) and uh sort of i think the implication there is that they haven't had a job in a really long time because this scene is chopped up with the credits and they don't Mm. just they should have just run the credits over the top of it but they keep like between every two lines it cuts to black screen with some credits on it and then it goes back to the conversation it just it it seems to go out like drag out for a really long time the liar is uh is like the famously a lovecraft sort of invention oh is it yeah 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 relia is the city that i think uh cthulhu comes from there's all this like weird like lovecraft tidbit sort of splashed through the movie because it's not like this is like a Lovecraft story like Reanimator or From Beyond or anything. It's a completely different story. It just happens to have these couple of little couple of little drips in it. They've proposed an expedition to Relia. Uh, we're going to get there. But it's not a city. <laughs> and it's got nothing to do with Cthulhu. It's just its own thing. So they're just like weird little name drops, I think. So Danae, Eddie and Court go and see a guy called Bill, uh, a former colleague of Court's played by Russ Tamblin, who I was very happy to see because I love Russ Tamblin, but he's not doing his finest work here. I, I like him, but uh, go ahead. What, what was his finest work? Well, West Side Story, obviously. Yeah, West Side Story and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers are like his famous early work, but I guess most modern people would know him as Dr. Jacoby from Twin Peaks. Okay. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've watched Twin Peaks, but... He's the guy with the uh, the glasses that like both lenses are different colors, and he's always playing with little ping pong balls and stuff. He's normally great in everything. I don't know why in this he's not particularly very good, but uh, I don't know. I, it, it's because the script is sort of fine. Like normally the problem is that like good actors are trying to make the best of a bad script, but this script is like fine as far as B movies go. So. Uh, he's maybe not they didn't pay him a lot. Maybe, maybe he's doing it as a favor. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm not giving 110 percent for this. This yeah. half, this half a day work. So he's he's uh, the the kooky lone survivor of the incident. He keeps saying uh, over and over again, the first expedition into the cave system. Yeah, yes, I've gone to see him because they need a map that he has of the caves. And he explains how he and his party were attacked by the creatures that live in those caves and he was the only survivor. Which, yeah, yeah, I guess it's just there to set up that, you know, the creatures do not mean well. Mm. And it's weird because they've called him up, they've gone to meet him, he's like, let's celebrate. And they're like, okay, he's, he's got the context of, of their meeting and they're like, all right, we need the map. And he's like, oh, no, I'm not giving you the map. <laughs> <laughs> well, why the fuck do you think they're there? Like, I just wanted someone to come visit me. He's like, I'm not giving you the map. It's too dangerous. And they're like, ah, oh, come on. And he's like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we need the movie to progress. So when, when we do eventually get to the set, to the cave site, to head off on our expedition, uh, Eddie's being a fucking mess. Like, she crawls out of the window of the car as if she's completely hung over and splashes hot coffee in her face to wake herself up. (laughs) Um, But thankfully, pretty soon we meet Professor Artemis Strock, played by Robert Quarry, and Andrew Paris, Jeffrey Combs. He's wearing some very tight pants and a little neckerchief. (laughs) I I didn't bother writing down what he was wearing because I knew you would. Uh, And Eddie's like, oh, this one's cute. And I'm like, yep. oh, channeling Lisa here. <laughs> uh, Every female character in the film ends up in love or wanting to fuck Andrew at some point. And 
I mean, obviously, he's adorable. Look at him. Yeah, it, that's sort of his thing. Like, he's a scientist, but before that, just all women love him. Well, he's he's playing an archaeological intern, and another mm. one of the little hints at Lovecraft is that he is studying at a little place called Miskatonic Institute. So, yeah, it's probably just a wink to fans just to be like, ah, uh, ah. Uh. They also, this is the only scene that I really hate in this film. Yeah. They realise that one of the members of their team is missing. They still mm-hmm. need to get Pedro, who's played by Tony Larea, who they've got in the trunk of their car. Like yeah. they, they knock on the trunk and they're like, hey, buddy. <laughs> and did he want to ride in there? Because there was space in the, in the car, in the seats. <laughs> Well, Eddie was asleep on the back seat, so... Uh, yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, it's bizarre. And then when they open, it plays a little, like, a little bit of Spanish acoustic guitar, and I'm like, oh, that's a bit on the nose. Yeah, he's uh, also, he's got, like, a bottle of booze in there with him, and his job is yeah. apparently to watch the cars while they're gone on this mission because they're like, we're going to be gone for a few days. There's two separate gags in the space of like a minute about Pedro being a thief. It's, it's mm. fucking racist. Like it's none of yeah. the film has this kind of grotesque exploitative feel about it, but this does. Yeah. Luckily. Uh, yeah. We come. Uh, yeah. We basically leave him with the cars and we never see him again. Yeah. We really don't see him for the rest of the film. No. Uh, so off they go. Most of them are not at all dressed appropriately for a multi-day expedition. There's a fun scene where Andrew and Danae are talking about um, her father. Uh, And yeah, this actress is really good. Like it's just the two of them walking through this grass and they're just having this quite natural, naturalistic conversation. Um, Jeff's really given her the eyes in this scene. (laughs) Yeah. uh, This is an audio podcast. I did a face, (laughs) everybody. (laughs) <laughs> that was given the eyes but yeah, yeah he's paying very close attention to what she's saying he's always helping her you know climb over things and stuff i mean everybody in this movie wants to fuck each other clearly hmm. there's there's a great scene where Danea, when they walk into the caves Danea says it's black as caviar in here and and you just hear you just hear eddie go it's black as caviar in here <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, I loved Eddie. Um, like, as soon as she splashed the coffee in her face, <laughs> I knew I'd love Eddie. Um, and she's got something sarcastic to say, like, almost after every single line. Like, and they're all bangers. They all made me laugh. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. She's, like, at the start when she was just, like, laughing at everything and being, like, kind of a trash bag, I was like, oh, was this character going to get annoying? But... Yeah. She does it. She's just kind of like the sassy comic relief, which is fun. Uh, yeah, well, there's, she's there's... the sassy comic relief, but also seemingly like the only capable one in the group. <laughs> like she, she, she never gets in like very serious trouble. She never really makes any mistakes or anything, and she sort of saves the day. Like, hey, everyone's got their own skills, as we find yeah. out, uh, right. except for the professor <laughs> who sucks. Um, uh, <laughs> there's another thing. There's another great little just comedy bit between Andrew and the professor, which is this. Professor. Yes. Professor, you're the mineralogist, isn't this feldspar? No. What is it? A rock. <laughs> uh, what was it? So before they go into the cave, um court is like giving them like you gotta listen to us if you want to stay alive and do exactly as we say and paris is like well how is that going to keep us alive and course like if you don't i'll kill you yeah and, and court keeps calling her a one tough talking dame that's his vibe <laughs> yeah he does he does have a vibe of like i guess yeah i guess a sort of 50s western type not not he's super the... western but western adjacent <laughs> Yeah, he's the sort of character that is sitting behind a desk when a tough talking dame walks through the door. So they decide yeah. they decide to hunker down for the night. They're having a great time, mainly because Court and Eddie and eventually Denea are getting drunk and making fun of Andrew for these little glasses that he has with like a little torch on them. Because he's a student, damn it, and he's taking notes. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Denea sits down like she's like, oh, it's cold. And she's 
sort of huddles up to Paris and, and is spraying herself with perfume in this cave. Um, yeah, and, they've got the whole uh, cave to sit in and she she settles down like right next to Andrew and he's just like, he's just like squished against this rock. It's like, yeah. well, yeah, coming on a bit strong there, ladies. Mm. Uh, this, so they sort of get drunk immediately uh, and the professor is like, he wants to go off on his own to look at rocks. Because uh, yep. he's a mineral mineral mineralologist. Mineralologist. There you go. So they call him the appraiser because uh, he knows how much all the rocks are worth. Um, well, it's useful when you're surrounded by rocks. You want to know if any of them can get you some money. Yeah. So he's looking around the cave. Then uh, a cave lady in a bikini. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> runs away from one of the monster guys yep we meet the cave woman played by michelle bauer who's credited as cave bunny soon there's a whole horde of those creatures as well um the she's the rest really something like out of the land that time forgot uh, she got that raquel welch sort of vibe. Mm. yes yes this um yeah. this apparently primitive but incredibly sexy loincloth bikini thing yeah the rest of the gang go to investigate and Andrew convinces the cave woman to go with them because, again, even though she's this cave woman, she also immediately wants to fuck Andrew and he has taken quite a shine to her as well. As I said, <laughs> if this was a more pornographic film, they all would have fucked each other later. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised it was it was as chaste as it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we only, get, we only get, I think, uh, two sets of titties later and then that's it. Mm. Yeah. The professor, like when when the bikini lady runs into the professor, he does the classic, like grab her and shake her angrily to try to calm her down. Yes, like, you're being that, hysterical, that woman. Well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't uh, think that's helpful. No. Um, well, well, what eventually happens is the group shoot at the creatures because they think the creatures want to attack them, and this was not the case. They very much just shot first and asked questions later. <laughs> um, yeah. But they do kill one, and when they examine the course, they when they examine the corpse, they find the necklace that they were looking for. Um, this is just another little soundbite I like of the dynamic between the group. What the hell are you talking about, Doc? They looked at us like we were a supermarket. Deli platter. Smorgasbord. Champagne brunch. Yeah, it's just, just a bit of fun. Just a bit of silly fun. Uh, I like uh, with the Paris is a Smorgies man. <laughs> That's, a um... refer- That's a reference no one's going to get. <laughs> So they they get the stones, um, but then the monsters come back and they have a uh, they have a bit of a biff again. So the professor's still pissed off that he's been trying to make friends with them and and you know they've been shot at and he can't get that communication across. And this is what he says: "What the hell's the matter with you? I'm trying to be your friend, you tub of shit." <laughs> that that really genuinely made me laugh a lot. That line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. um also the group like they've got four guns between them they're all apparently Mm. terrible shots because they they're all set upon by these creatures and they don't hit they hardly hit anything well i think one of them like runs out yeah jeffrey combs uh he runs out of bullets because they fucking unloaded on that one monster yeah they shoot the first one like a million times and then when they all come back they're out of bullets and but he works out that they're scared of the flashlights Mm. And, yeah. Uh, so he scares them all off, but Danae's missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone except Strock is like, they must. She must have been taken by the creatures. We have to go find her. Like Strock, the professor just wimps out immediately. <laughs> he just yeah. Doesn't... Strock's like, well, she's dead. Let's go. Yeah. And they're yeah. all like, no, nah, she's paying our checks. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> he's literally like, these are bloodthirsty animals. We're not going to go and rescue a corpse. You don't know she's dead, mate. <laughs> But also, you were trying to talk to them three seconds ago. Yeah. It was like, we don't know their meme. Thankfully, so. once they find the creature's spot, Strock and, the, Strock and the cave bunny hang back, and they find the creatures have put Denea on this, like, big cartoony, like, spit, like a spit roast. Yeah. And they're rubbing, like, minced garlic or something into her thighs. It's I thought I mean, it was, like, he was slapping Crisco on her thighs, and it's yeah. a very gratuitous shot. It is. Uh, I also realized that that particular scene, it's got to be someone's kink and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
like that that yeah. whole scene of like a you know the woman on the spit like it absolutely would have awakened something for someone and just watching it knowing <laughs> that i was like oh no i like there's a big bit of foam padding underneath her so she's not uncomfortable well of course you don't want to be uncomfortable yeah. on a on on a rotating spit even if you are about to eat someone you want them to die comfortably yeah uh, there's all of, there's a whole bunch of like sort of people corpses lying around, but yeah, they're doing the whole cooking her on a spit roast, and she's just sort of pleading with them. She's doing the whole, no, please don't, uh, let me go. Yeah, and they're well, goblins. Like. Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the the three who have gone to chase to chase the creatures away, they chase them away quite easily, uh, just with yeah. the torches. They're, they're skittish as hell, which which works for for them a lot. This is when I was like, oh, this movie's The Abyss. It's like, <laughs> it's exactly the same. No. Uh, <laughs> they, get, they get her off and, like, as they're fleeing, she spends a lot of time trying to, like, run and also get dressed at the same time. It's like... Yeah, she, she's why trying don't to pull you... her chains up. Yeah, it's like, why don't you flee from the danger and then, like, do your pants up? Like, what do you think is more important in this moment? <laughs> I like that because she makes everybody else wait. She's like, no, no, wait, 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 wait. And then, <laughs> and then <laughs> like, what the fuck? You need to run. Andrew's like, no, kind I'm of like, I gotta put my jeans up. Andrew's like literally like pulling her across, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, she gets her jeans up and she runs away. They don't, they, I mean, the, the guys they're running from, they never, there's never a moment of conviction from the mutants. They all sort of shamble and, and wobble and, Sometimes they walk into frame and sort of stand there and look around. Uh, so they're yeah, they're pretty easy to get away from. So as they're fleeing, they bump into Robbie the robot. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, they run away from the monsters and they and then they run into Robbie the fucking robot, and it's literally Robbie the robot from Forbidden Planet. Well, I noticed that like because I I've never seen Forbidden Planet and I was Google imaging Robbie the robot and like mm. his his like robo dome head bit looks different I mean he's still credited as yeah. Robbie the robot but he's definitely got those same like like fat Michelin man legs you know the ones that are just like a bunch of balls stacked on top of each other so they I I looked this up and it is it is Robbie the robot but Robbie the robot had a bunch of different like head attachments ah. so he could be in like a lot of different movies uh, so he's not wearing the same head mm. that he wore in Forbidden Planet, but he was sort of like, oh, well, we've we've spent incredible amounts of money on this prop, hundreds of dollars. <laughs> we're not going to, we're not going to replace uh, Robbie. We'll just give him a head, like a, a modular head, and he can be different robots in different movies. We've spent upwards uh, of $85 on this guy. <laughs> That's half the film's budget. Um, <laughs> it is also funny to be credited as Robbie the Robot and not whoever the person is inside Robbie the Robot. Yeah. I don't know if I'd be pissed off about that or not because Robbie's pretty famous. Like, Yeah. yeah. As, far as, as far as sci-fi robots go, Robbie was a big deal. <laughs> um, the cast make a real meal out of this out of out of this apparent fight with the robot they're really just running in circles around this very slow moving top heavy robot like just yeah. run away they're just like running uh, in circles around him like they're taunting him yeah they they're just yeah they're running around in circles they're waving their arms they're sort of dodging and that you can tell that there was no there was no real direction they just sort of put the lasers in in post and everybody's sort of like, oh, I'll go to the left and oh, you'll go to the right. And yeah. Danae gets out her little pocket mirror and she doesn't like dive for the laser or anything. She just stands there and smiles and wiggles it just a teeny little bit. But she's got this big shit eating grin on her face <laughs> and the laser. Yeah, of course, it hits her tiny pocket mirror and bounces back and short circuits the robot. Jeff does some fun yeah. physical stuff in this scene, like a lot of like ducking and weaving and somersaulting and bouncing yeah, around he, does, he sort of rolls and and he's he's just he's just a great actor he's just, he's just great in those early days i think he was very proud of and he's he said it before of how often he did his own stunts where where he where he could and where he was allowed so you ah. do see him being quite physical in a lot of his early films because i think he really enjoyed it 
Yeah. Well, I, I think, yeah, uh, a lot of, a, a lot of actors that I like, are, uh, are, are very good physical actors as well. And physical comedy is something that's very, very hard to do. He's, he stands out. Yeah. This is, this is also the scene where one of the, the goblin men run out and he just sort of looks around and then one of the lasers hits him and he goes up in flames <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's really like a really obvious cut between the goblin and a guy in a flame suit like they have to set it up they can't have him in motion he's got to stand still so we can get the guy in this, the exact same spot <laughs> Yeah, and you didn't yeah. need that shot. I think they just were like, well, this movie needs a person on fire, obviously. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Like, you're not going to not have a guy on fire. <laughs> what, what did you think when the robot showed up? Well, I, I, I was like, oh, that's, that's cheap looking. <laughs> <for this." laughs> but then I was also like, oh, it's, it's really funny to see a robot like that in an 80s movie. It must be an homage to something else. And then I was like, oh, it must be that famous robot that's in a lot of those films because I'm I'm not as familiar with like Forbidden Planet and stuff like that so I was like oh it it, it just must be you know another homage to those early sci-fi movies and if you know of course it is because I'm like otherwise you wouldn't have this robot that looked like this in this movie I think you would have yeah you would have had a completely different concept unless it was a unless it was related to something else I don't know that it would have been like, is it an intentional homage? I don't know. So the Phantom Empire, so it was that 1935 thing. We've got a lot of homage stuff going on, but I, I suspect that they they went to the warehouse and they were like, let's fucking Robbie the robot. <laughs> <laughs> let's chuck that in come, there. Come, yeah, let's, let's put that in the movie. <laughs> yeah. um, just like just like at, you know, like B movie warehouse filling a trolley full of full of props yeah. and things from other movies being like, yeah, this will be a bit of fun. Get six to ten old lady wigs. <laughs> um. <laughs> and apparently there's one of the vehicles, I'm not sure, but one of the vehicles is, I think, originally from Logan's Run. Um, oh. There's probably a lot of little hints at other famous sci-fi sort of things. Denea so... is so jealous that Andrew tried to save the cave bunny. She is, like, obsessed with him at this point. Yeah. Like... She's they're in very this very jealous. They're in this life or death situation, and she just keeps on being like, "Oh well, why just save your girlfriend then?" It's like, can you like focus on the task at hand? You almost got murdered. <laughs> you almost got eaten by goblins. You you weirdo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's basically Eddie's reaction as well. Yeah, she's uh, kind of like, oh, this, this this fucking basic bitch here." <laughs> <laughs> they're like, "Well, that was weird. There was a robot." Let's continue down this cave. And uh, they get outside and they're like, ah, oh, it's Lilia. And it's just like the same cave that they walked into. Well, they said, <laughs> so Strock says, I don't think it'll get much darker. And you know why he says that? Because there's an active volcano right in front of them. Yeah. But, <laughs> and they just, they, they point all over the hill. They all point. And it cuts to like some stock footage of a volcano. Yeah. But also, all of this is just shot outside in the middle of the fucking day. <laughs> like, but yeah, the, the explanation is that there's an active volcano. Yeah. They're not very bothered yeah. about it either. They're just like, hey, no. that, that volcano is just, just right there. <laughs> uh, like, eh. And then they just, they just go about. You know, they're like, all right, uh, it's it's Relia. It's just big open space with a volcano. Yeah. And then some more cave ladies, some more cave bunnies show up, uh, waving their spears around. Yes. And, Eddie has uh, the right reaction to this because she just says, get a load of this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's <laughs> the voice of the audience. <laughs> yeah, the... Eddie spends the entire movie sick of everyone's fucking nonsense. Um, yeah. The cave woman is soon followed by a blonde woman in this weird vehicle. She's in this amazing 80s leather getup. I'll, I'll post some screen caps. But this is the Alien Queen, played by Sybil yeah. Danning, obviously big, big B-movie star. Uh, she doesn't have a huge amount to do in this. She spends probably 90% of her screen time walking. 
yeah <laughs> um yeah she she's really not like for the for the film's main villain she doesn't really get a lot to do or say she just sort of calls them dumb a couple of times yeah marches around uh yeah they cut to her beat the crap out of court though <laughs> yeah but they there's so many shots where they've just cut to her you know hurriedly walking somewhere and she obviously can't run very fast in her very high heeled boots but it's just her sort of realizing that they've gone the other way and she's like okay I better go that way so it's it's kind of walking reaction shots is all she really does but importantly she is breasts ahoy she is (laughs) she's got a big old boob window in her outfit uh she's got like that very the perfect sharp blonde hair Mm -hmm. um Every, yeah. everything's black leather except for her boots which are like silver knee high yeah high heel boots she's hot it's an amazing it's amazing and the characters say so like when she steps out of the car they're yeah they're, be, they're hel- being held at spear point by cave ladies and then a space car rocks up and <laughs> a dominatrix with a giant boob window steps out jeffrey's is like fuck yeah this is great <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, and, she's... and Court's reaction is sort of the same. And yeah. she steps out and sort of inspects the goods uh, of all the, the, the main cast. And she's like, oh, you're all very unimpressive, except for you. She, she quite likes uh, Jeffrey Combs. Yeah, uh... she, ta- she takes a special interest in him immediately, gets very yeah. handsy very quickly. So she decides to take the hostages to a different cave, but not Andrew. She's going to take him somewhere special. I... I haven't. I realized when I was looking at Sybil Denning's IMDb that I don't think I've ever actually seen a film with her in it, and I haven't. I, I definitely haven't seen Battle Beyond the Stars, which I think is probably her most well-known film that I guess a lot of people really really enjoy her in. So I'd like to see that because I'd like to see her doing something a bit more interesting than what's happening in here. Because <laughs> yeah, she doesn't have yeah. a lot to do. We do cut to where she has kept Andrew hostage. She's got him tied to a chair in this kind of, I don't know, an ad hoc laboratory sort of thing. They found the Star Trek set and they were like, can we squeeze it into this cave? But the point is she um, she has plans for Andrew. Uh, this is the conversation that they have. Are you from another planet? Ship crashed. It's useless now. Be repaired. The robot mined crystals, diamonds, could have been fuel. But you destroyed that hope. Well, sorry about that, but he did try to excavate our skulls, you know. Well, now your people will take its place in the mines. And when the ship's ready, you and I'll move on. Right? Oh, well, since you put it that way. I... Yeah, she, she, she's, she's really into him and he's fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's definitely, he's more than fine with it. Uh, yeah, she's taking, them, she's taking them prisoner and she orders her uh, cave bunnies to take off, to take Court and the professor to a jail cell and to take the ladies somewhere else. Um, yeah, it's really strange because they they lock up Court and the Professor, but yeah. when we whenever we cut to Eddie and Danea with a couple of cave bunnies, they're just all kind of walking together. Like there's no sense of danger or threat. <laughs> and then nah. so Eddie and Danea are kind of walking a few steps behind uh, two oblivious cave women, and then they just go, "Hey, do you want to just leave?" And so they do. They just run the other way. <laughs> and the cave women don't even try to chase them. This seems to be like Eddie's like modus operandi. Uh, she's every time she's in a in a troubling situation, she's like, hey, how about we just walk off? And it works. <laughs> yeah. It works can, every time. <laughs> you can just leave. Just walk away. Yeah. I like uh, when the, the cave bunnies are pointing the spears at Danae, she's like, Oh, no, no, no. They're pointing the spears at Struck. And, and he's like, I think they want us to come with them. And Eddie's like, 
did you go to school to get out smart? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that was my favorite line of hers. Yeah. Uh, she gets more uh, and more likable and relatable as the film goes on, I think. Yeah. And so the the men, so they're in a cage too. Then the cave girl comes up and she's like sighing to them. And they're like, I think she wants us to go with her. And they just walk the fuck away too. Yeah. So the original cave bunny helps the guys escape from whatever cage they were in. It, yeah, yeah it's, it's not clear. She she must have just, I don't know, opened a latch or something. <laughs> Definitely but, not but clear. All, like captive for such a short amount of, t- like not even a full scene. Like why even hold them captive in the first place? <laughs> because Alien Queen wants to be alone with Andrew. We do cut back to them and it's not clear what she's doing to him in this scene. So I assumed that mm. she was kissing him, but then when I rewound yeah. it, I realized she's just sort of standing on him. Like, yeah, uh, she's got a leg across, like she's doing a, a kind of a big pose. Yeah, I'll I'll take some screen off. caps and I'll I'll you know I'll draw a fucking diagram because it's so confusing. Especially because yeah. when they when they cut back, she's sort of standing in front of him. She's standing, he's seated. So his head is, I guess, at sort of her like midriff level, and she's not leaning down enough to be able to kiss him. But she's also, neither of them are moving when we cut back to them. So it doesn't look like <laughs> they're making out either. It's, it's so weird. Like, why not just actually get her to kiss him? And then, and then we'll be like, okay, that's what she's trying to do. Anyway, so Cave Bunny takes the guys outside and <laughs> the professor finds like these prehistoric plants. And he's like, I immediately know that these are prehistoric and that there's nothing on earth like them. They haven't existed for a million years. And then they also find a dinosaur corpse, which they somehow immediately know that it's a dinosaur. Yeah. It is funny how they... how little court gives a shit about that, though. Yeah. And it's it's funny how that, like, uh, Danae and, and, um, and Eddie go through a similar sort of scenario off on their own. Yeah. They're all, like, kind of both separated but doing the same thing the professor's like what kind of life is it if we have to run from dinosaurs and <laughs> like well let's just leave um and eddie and uh danae have have bumped into the first c uh not cgi stop motion dinosaur of the film yeah uh, they just they just she just kind of points to it like Eddie's just kind of like, hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we kill that thing over there and eat it if you're so hungry? And then it, uh, Danae is like, what thing? And then it just goes, that thing. And it's just a dinosaur, like right in front of them. Just standing around, just, yep. just being uh, on the scenery. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's real like, I don't know, it gave me Ray Harryhausen vibes. It's Absolutely. not badly done. Yeah, it's uh, very Harry has it. It's very charming in its own way. It, yeah, I, I liked them. Um, and it definitely like you put a stop motion dinosaur in your movie and it's and it's gone up two stars. Uh, <laughs> from, like immediately. Uh, it's got <laughs> that, that's how you get Harry. <laughs> yeah. Although I have I swear I've seen these dinosaurs before. Maybe they just maybe all you've seen one stop motion dinosaur, you've seen them all. But uh yeah, they Oh, what does Danae say? They, she's like, she says, it's like a lost world, like in the movies. <laughs> like, yes. The, the fucking name of the movie. Yeah, like. Yeah, it is like a lost world, Danae. <laughs> yeah. They also like, there's a couple of scenes where they spot dinosaurs and no one is shocked by it. Like there's no Sam Neill in Jurassic Park style overwhelming emotion of the appreciation of this magnificent beast that no human being has ever seen. They're just kind of like, ugh, yucky. Yeah. Oh, oh no, a dinosaur. But yeah, there's there's no impact to it. Uh, And because it is just a fucking footnote in the movie. (laughs) Yeah. They do the dinosaur bit and they were like, well, that was the dinosaur bit. We'll move the fuck on. Yeah, there's no explanation as to why the dinosaurs are even there because you've got Alien Queen and you've got the cave creatures and then you've also got dinosaurs. It's like, are these things all related or are they just all in tandem 
like living separately in this cave system. It's not really clear. The dinosaurs are just there for fun. We got, yeah, cave people, aliens, robots, dinosaurs. We're just, it's the cave of slap the fuck whatever in it. And uh, I'm, I'm here for it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's the cave uh, of everything Harry likes. Yeah, you know, and if it had been an homage to, you know, the 1935, it's got fucking cowboys in it too somewhere. Um, yeah. And what is it? So a big fucking uh, T-Rex comes out. T-Rex yeah. comes out of a cave and they're like, oh, look, the T-Rex, because none of the characters can share screen time. They can't share a shot because that's not how the effect works <laughs> uh, with the stop motion dinosaur. And so T-Rex fights a big stop motion sort of mean looking lizard. Uh, they have a fight and uh, it takes the, the, the lizard back into its cave and then it comes back out again and Court's like, let's leave yeah and... but, but then the alien queen spears the t-rex and that's really one of the few things that she actually gets to do that isn't walking yeah she's very confident the t-rex comes out like squares her up and and she's like oh yeah i'll fight a t-rex uh and she, yeah she just picks up a, a spear that was lying on the ground and pegs it at the t-rex uh it doesn't kill the t-rex it hurts it but she just salutes it and waltzes off on her merry way. Just another day in the life of sexy alien queen. Yeah. The guys in the cave bunny go to save Andrew. Um, the cave bunny attacks attacks the other woman, the other cave woman who was guarding Andrew, and Andrew's all tied up. And the guys don't get up to yeah. save him right away because they do just want to stay and watch this fight between the two cave women because... You know, it's two women in bikinis rolling around on the ground, so they're just yeah. gonna they're just gonna stay and watch it for a sec, hey? Yeah, they tear each other's tops off. It's of very course. quiet and just sort of scuffly. Yeah, <laughs> it it is one of the few things in the film that does just look like amateur pornography. Thankfully, mm. it's it's over pretty quickly. So the cave bunny ends up topless, and she also stays topless for a long time after this scene. There's like two separate yeah. scenes afterwards where they could have put a shirt on her and they just didn't. Well, the, the cast have to be like, uh, what is it? Court, I think, yeah. ends up saying, can you, hey, can you put a top on her? It's very distracting. Yeah. Um, also, the, and... the, the cave bunny is so happy when Andrew is free that she licks his face like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. loves him. And the men are like, we got to get whatever you are got. And he's just, uh, Paris is like, oh, it's my curse. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's like, yeah, what are you going to do? All the women love me, huh? It's, uh, it's you know, it's, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to do it, eh? He's not from New York in the film. It's just, that's just creative license on my part. <laughs> they decide to steal, like, the alien queen's vehicle, so they all jump in. And again, she spends the rest of the film just kind of walking behind this vehicle. <laughs> um when they're in the vehicle, there's a great shot where uh, Andrew, Denea, and the cave bunny are all in the back seat, and Andrew like puts both of his arms around each lady, like like an absolute little slut. Like he's <laughs> he's having the yeah. best time. Yeah, yeah, I love this scene because they're all they're they're all sitting in this space car, and they're all kind of doing that the TV rock around. Yeah, where they're, like, <laughs> rocking back and forth for the camera. But Eddie is fucking going ham. Like, <laughs> yeah. The rest of the characters are all kind of rocking around a little bit. Yeah, Eddie is bouncing up and down as fast and hard as she can. Yeah, it's like, whoa! <laughs> like they're whoa, on a roller coaster like, or something. Like a play school character driving a car. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about uh, Eddie and Court's first kiss in the movie. Is right at the end. Uh, before they hop in the car they go past a volcanic crater and Eddie kind of goes, Whoa, and Court's like, don't fall in there. Even though there's, you know, many meters of space around to walk around it. It's <laughs> like, a, don't, not a don't, threat at all. No, don't fall in there. And she's like, Oh, you'd miss me. And he's like, of course I'd miss you. I love you. And he gives her a kiss and she's like, Oh, and gives yeah. him a kiss. Yeah, I, I, think, uh, uh, I think that they're just meant to be like an old, worn-in couple, you know, people have yeah. been together for ages and they, you know, they know each other like the back of their hands and, yeah. It was it, just, a, it was an oddly sweet moment. Uh, yeah, for these two very with... rough-around-the-edges characters. Yeah. Anyway, they're in the car. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, and they picked yeah. up a bunch of diamonds. There was just a bunch of diamonds lying around. Yeah, they, yeah, they just filled they their pockets. Their bags. Yeah, and it definitely uh, doesn't just look like broken glass. No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is where we get um, Court is sort of like in wonderment at Andrew's sort of proficiency with women, and this is where he says this. Kid, you got to tell me how you do that. What? <laughs> what can I say? It's a chemical imbalance. I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just like, hey, you know, what are you gonna do? I'm Andrew Paris. <laughs> you know, I'm good. Yeah. With, I'm good with archaeology. I'm good with ladies. I've got my little That's... neckerchief. <laughs> I'm adorable. He's quite, yeah, he's he's a real like yeah, Fred from Scooby Doo. Not yes. quite as preppy, yeah, but pretty preppy. The vehicle does get stuck, and they think it's about to explode, so they run out of the caves, and it does eventually explode. Which yeah. Is. They all seem to just have an innate knowledge of when it's going to blow up and that it is going to blow up. Like one of them goes, I can smell something funny. And one of them's like, it's hydraulic fluid. This thing's going to blow up this alien technology that we just discovered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and... It's amazing how similar to a normal Earth car it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite, quite amazing how similar. <laughs> uh it's definitely not just a golf cart with a spaceship slapped on the top of it it's, it's on the outside when they're outside the cave andrew says what about her meaning the alien queen who's been idly following them and court just goes who cares let's have some champagne <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all they, it's all been about the glory for him She's somehow kept up. She's like it's this movie thing where the where the bad guy only ever walks and somehow keeps pace with everybody, and even though they're driving in a moon space car through a <laughs> cave, she's kept up with them. Uh, they get out of the car and run away, uh, and they run out the front of the cave, and uh, the alien queen reaches the car. She seems to sense that it's going to blow up as well but she walks back into the cave uh and then uh there's a very real explosion it looks like (laughs) yeah it does it definitely uh, looks like they detonated something inside of that possibly precarious cave they did uh it looks like a very legit explosion coming out of the mouth of that cave and like the wind goes it goes out and then it gets sucked back in and then it comes out again looks Mm. like a real uh yeah they really set off something in there <laughs> and but then the effect of everybody standing around outside meant and it's meant to be like the light of the fire on them it's very clearly just an orange light and someone's got a stick in front of the camera and is wiggling <laughs> it back and forth like <laughs> terrifying uh, uh, yeah the the alien queen you'll be happy to know though is fine she's back in the mm-hmm. caves and she spots a bunch of the cave creatures and she says something like, now you'll be sorry. And then she gets into this sort of fighting stance. And that's the end of the movie. So she's like, yeah. she's like against the cave creatures. Like she was never, like you never see them in the same scene, I don't think. But does she want to fight them? I always thought that they were all part of the same kind of team. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe she's, she blames them, the, the, sort of vicariously responsible for her spaceship being a space car being blown up yeah and i think she, and, she, she's probably annoyed that her uh, her precious andrew got away because i think she was planning to mate or something <laughs> propagate the species uh, uh what, what, then, what beautiful children i love this on the credits it comes up with coming soon phantom empire 2 the land where time said fuck it <laughs> yeah i love that it it's yeah. that, that's what i mean about the kind of things that show that this movie has its own sense of humor it also says oh. filmed on location at the center of the earth <laughs> yeah <laughs> i i wouldn't be surprised if it's filmed in the same spot as like a bunch of those old films uh they got a cave system in where did you say california yeah uh and uh yeah those hills they're ripe for putting stop motion dinosaurs on yeah i think there actually is only like two locations i think there's apart from like 
any of the interior shots there's there's the caves and then there's just a bunch of there's like a rocky area that's yeah just rocks that they walk along i'm so yeah i'd love to shoot a film in six days that sounds so fucking fun (laughs) yeah especially with like that many cast members i mean i know that you don't have like a huge amount of deviation from the script like you're really just wandering around and a lot of it would be in post I guess because they have to do like the stop motion dinosaurs and stuff so you just point the camera at the blank space in the rocks and then go we'll get a dinosaur in there later yeah yeah (laughs) it's 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 genuinely a lot of fun it's it knows what it is it's not trying to be fucking i don't know logan's run or some other epic sci-fi adventure six days i can't get over six days (laughs) uh well there's a there's a challenge for you harry you know just uh just what what you need to do you need to you need to be a fred olin ray type and make a huge amount of b movies to build up your your name and your cash flow and then you know get a bunch of money that you can just go and film with a bunch of a, a ragtag group of cast members in the, the California <laughs> desert for a week. Yeah. Yeah. That all sounds very achievable. That's... Now that you've <laughs> you've separated the parts for me. <laughs> That's the dream. I'll just make a list. That's I'm actually I'm looking forward to going back and watching maybe some Sybil Danning movies now. Uh what did you say? Battle Beyond the Stars? Yeah, I think so. I think that's you know the 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 one that she's it's her reanimator you know the one that she's sort of known for i would like to try to find something where sybil danning is doing a bit more because i think that she probably is this fun b-movie actress i mean especially in this she's uh sort of amazonian like she's very tall very strong looking uh you know strong face as well and incredibly gorgeous as well so Mm. yeah be fun to see her as more of these you know big bossy barbarella types Reminded me of, uh, there's a movie called Alienator, which is a weird ripoff of Terminator, where it's a similar sort of, yeah, do- large dominatrixy alien lady. <laughs> Except she's got one big laser arm and she walks around blasting everybody. That's a fun movie, if you like, if that's, if that's your specific thing. Look, I imagine there is a huge market for that. <laughs> Both sexually and non-sexually. Yeah. But we've, it's really fallen out of favour since the 80s. And we, don't see, we don't see nearly enough of that in movies these days. Yeah. We need an Amazonian alien lady renaissance. Yeah. There was a whole, there's like a whole subgenre of like stop motion dinosaur because they all copied um, Harry the Housen. land that time forgot. Ray yeah. Harryhausen, Raquel Welsh. Uh and like right up till the early 90s there was sort of a steady output of bikini cave girls and dinosaur <laughs> uh so i i don't know titty rubber dinosaur movies and <laughs> you know after 1991 they just disappeared off the face of the earth like we were done with those everything got yeah. so serious in the 90s everyone lost their their sense of fun mm. And it, it definitely wasn't that there was maybe 20 too many of those movies. There's never enough, Harry. What you want is a glut of them so that people can choose their favourites. Yeah. I, I mean, what, what else can you say about this? It's What, Phantom Empire? It's, it's a bloody joy yeah, is Empire. what you can say. It is. It's, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. I don't know if I had as much fun as you did. I, was def- I definitely recognised that this was a film for you. Uh, <laughs> Any film with Jeffrey Combs in it is a film for me. Yeah. Well, that's Phantom Empire. I like it. Good bit of fun, especially if you can grab uh, a copy of like the Blu-ray or the DVD because, you know, the there's some like kind of crappy quality copies out there, which, you know, they're kind of grainy and, you know, not super fun. So if you can get your hands on like a, an actual like a Blu-ray copy, and I think the Blu-ray has commentary from Fred Olin Ray, which I really want to 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 get like my my copy doesn't have that so uh i'd really like to hear his <laughs> his thoughts on on this masterpiece if you want to watch a nice crisp clear jeffrey that's what i recommend <laughs> in, in all his glory i'll definitely be checking out the serial the 1935 thing that this was based on i'll based, see if i can sit through it 
yeah well yeah ba- based on in in uh in air quotes and he definitely uh i don't know the way he holds himself in this in this one he's very he's like striking a heroic pose in almost every scene he's in yeah when he walks he's got a bit of a swagger he like he puffs his chest out and he's really yeah yeah he's got a he's 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 channeling every bit of sex appeal that he has yeah it's Uh, interesting when i think about this character and i think that dr mordred could have used more of this energy a bit more swagger yeah yeah because like i i love dr mordred but i think that dr mordred needed more of what whatever he's channeling for andrew paris this sort of slightly lothario confidence and a, a little bit of a little bit of swashbuckling energy you know he's not trying to be zoro yeah. in phantom empire but he's got a bit more of that i think he's too demure in dr mordred yeah it was it maybe yeah it would benefit from being a little less serious but it was meant to be based on the doctor's strange character which is yeah. sort of a he's sort of a serious character which i don't think that's not the right angle you want for a fucking interment interdimensional wizard like yeah yeah it's in, it's inherently should, silly. he should be fun and silly like, yeah it's an inherently serious. silly idea you should have fun with it yeah mm. all right harry anything to plug i mean obviously uh, uh you know for for people that don't know harry and i do uh other podcasts together as part of the the consumption gang we do pun watch and Failure to Launch. I'm sure I've mentioned them before, but Pun Watch is a competitive pun-based quiz game. Failure to Launch is uh, a podcast where we look at failed TV pilots. Those are really fun too. If you've enjoyed, if you've enjoyed Harry and I's dynamic chemistry in this, <laughs> so those podcasts are very fun. And I, I I'll, I'll plug my Twitter, which is at Brimdang. You, like every now and then, I'm posting because uh, I've, I've been watching a lot of B movies. Uh, since last year real stinkers I'll, I'll chuck up like a little mini tweet <laughs> review every now and then I do want people to check out it's only an hour it's a sci-fi called mutilations it's fucking it's on youtube look it up uh it's incredible uh, mutilations but, when's uh, that from oh, I think 86 but it was made by an accountant and that's got some <laughs> more that's got some stop motion aliens in it and it's just oh Mm, mm. Oh. it's a work of art uh, but um, that sounds great yeah at brimdang that'll take you to my art twitter account there's been a lot going on and i haven't had much time to make art but things have calmed down now mm. um so i should be posting more stuff on my art twitter which is at dang brim but my, my at brimdang will take you to that <laughs> all right cool. i see what you, um, i see what you did there <laughs> yeah well, thanks for having me on your show. It was a lot of fun. No, thank I'm you. Glad, I'm glad you got me to watch this movie. And as usual, you can find the podcast on at Reanimates Pod on Twitter and Instagram. All the episodes end up on YouTube as well, if that's how you like to listen to podcasts. I know some people do. And we're also on Tumblr. You can uh, at, Re- at Reanimates Podcast, I think it is on, on Tumblr. That's fun too. Otherwise, if you see me in the street, you can also just come and say hello. That's fine too. Lisa, Lisa, you little shit. I'm going to round you up and beat your hairy little butt. Lisa, where are you? Come here so I can whip your ass. That's what you say to her on the street. Simon! Simon! <laughs>